In some ways, Sheila, you've got no sense at all. But someone's trying to involve me. That postcard. It, it must have been sent by someone who knows I took that clock. And the, and the postcard itself, the old Bailey. If, if my father was a criminal... What do you know about your father and mother? My father and mother died in an accident when I was a baby. That's what my aunt told me, what I've always been told. But she never speaks about them. She never tells me anything about them. Sometimes, once or twice, when I asked, she's told me things about them that aren't the same as what she's told me before. So I've always known, you see, that, well, that there's something wrong. Go on. So I think perhaps my father was some kind of criminal, perhaps even a murderer. Or perhaps it was my mother. People don't say your parents are dead and can't or won't tell you anything about those parents unless the real reason is something, you know, something they think would be too awful for you to know. So you got yourself all worked up. It's probably quite simple. You may just have been an illegitimate child. Well, I thought of that, too. People do sometimes try and hide that kind of thing from children. It's very stupid. You'd much better just tell them the real truth. It doesn't matter as much nowadays. But the whole point is, you see, that I don't know. I don't know what's behind all this. Why was I called Rosemary? It's not a family name. It means remembrance, doesn't it? Which could be a nice meaning, I pointed out. Yes, it could. But I don't feel it was. Anyway, after the inspector had asked me questions that day, I began to think, why had someone wanted to get me there? To get me there with a strange man who was dead, or was it the dead man who'd wanted me to meet him there? Was he perhaps my father, and he wanted me to do something for him? And then... Someone had come along and killed him instead, or or did someone want to make make out from the beginning that it, that it was I who had killed? Him? Oh, I was all mixed up and frightened. It seemed somehow as if everything was being made to point at me, getting me there, and a dead man, and my name Rosemary on my own clock that didn't belong there. So I got in a panic and did something that was stupid, as you say. And I shook my head at her. You've been reading or typing too many thrillers and mystery stories, I said accusingly. What about Edna? Haven't you any idea at all what she'd got into her head about you? Why did she come all the way to your house to talk to you when she saw you every day at the office? I've no idea. She couldn't have thought I had anything to do with the murder. She couldn't. Could it have been something she overheard and made a mistake about? There was nothing, I tell you, nothing. I wondered. I couldn't help wondering. Even now, I didn't trust Sheila to tell the truth. Have you got any personal enemies? Disgruntled young men, jealous girls, someone or other a bit unbalanced who might have it in for you? It sounded most unconvincing as I said it. Well, of course not. So there it was. Even now, I wasn't sure about that clock. It was a fantastic story. Four, one, three... What did those figures mean? Why write them on a postcard with the word remember, unless they would mean something to the person to whom the postcard was sent? I sighed, paid the bill, and got up. Don't worry, I said. Surely the most fatuous words in the English or any other language. The Colin Lamb personal service is on the job. You're going to be all right and we're going to be married and live happily ever after on practically nothing a year. By the way, I said, unable to stop myself, though I knew it would have been better to end on the romantic note, but the Colin Lamb personal curiosity drove me on. What have you actually done with that clock? Hidden it in your stocking drawer? She waited just a moment before she said, I put it in the dustbin of the house next door. I was quite impressed. It was simple and probably effective. To think of that had been clever of her. Perhaps I'd underestimated Sheila. Chapter 24 Colin Lamb's Narrative When Sheila had gone, I went across to the Clarendon, packed my bag, and left it ready with the porter. It was the kind of hotel where they're particular about your checking out before noon. Then I set out. My route took me past the police station, and after hesitating a moment, I went in. I asked for Hardcastle, and he was there. I found him frowning down at a letter in his hand. I'm off again this evening, Dick, I said. Back to London. He looked up at me with a thoughtful expression. Will you take a piece of advice from me? No, I said immediately. 
He paid no attention. People never do when they want to give you advice. I should get away and stay away, if you know what's best for you. Nobody can judge what's best for anyone else. I doubt that. I'll tell you something, Dick. When I've tidied up my present assignment, I'm quitting. At least. I think I am. Why? I'm like an old-fashioned Victorian clergyman. I have doubts. Give yourself time. I wasn't sure what he meant by that. I asked him what he himself was looking so worried about. Read that. He passed me the letter he'd been studying. Dear sir, I've just thought of something. You asked me if my husband had any identifying marks, and I said he hadn't. But I was wrong. Actually, he has a kind of scar behind his left ear. He cut himself with a razor when a dog we had jumped up at him, and he had to have it stitched up. It was so small and unimportant, I never thought of it the other day. Yours truly, Marlena Rival. She writes a nice dashing hand, I said, though I've never really fancied purple ink. Did the deceased have a scar? He had a scar, all right, just where she says. Didn't she see it when she was shown the body? Hardcastle shook his head. The ear covers it. You have to bend the ear forward before you can see it. Then no, that's all right. Nice piece of corroboration. What's eating you? Hardcastle said gloomily that this case was the devil. He asked if I'd be seeing my French or Belgian friend in London. Probably. Why? I mentioned him to the chief constable, who says he remembers him quite well. That girl guide murder case. I was to extend a very cordial welcome to him if he's thinking of coming down here. Not he, I said. The man's practically a limpet. It was a quarter past twelve when I rang the bell at 62 Wilbraham Crescent. Mrs. Ramsay opened the door. She hardly raised her eyes to look at me. What is it? she said. Can I speak to you for a moment? I was here about ten days ago. You may not remember. She lifted her eyes to study me further. A faint frown appeared between her eyebrows. You came... You were with the police inspector, weren't you? That's right, Mrs. Ramsay. Can I come in? If you want to, I suppose. One doesn't refuse to let the police in. You'd take a very poor view of it if you did. She led the way into the sitting room, made a brusque gesture towards a chair, and sat down opposite me. There had been a faint acerbity in her voice, but her manner now resumed the listlessness which I'd not noted in it previously. I said, It seems quiet here today. I suppose your boys have gone back to school. Yes, it does make a difference. She went on, I suppose you want to ask me some more questions, do you, about this last murder? The girl who was killed in the telephone box? No, not exactly that. I'm not really connected with the police, you know. She looked faintly surprised. I thought she was Sergeant Lamb, wasn't it? My name's Lamb, yes, but I work in an entirely different department. The listlessness vanished from Mrs. Ramsay's manner. She gave me a quick, hard, direct stare. Oh, she said, well, what is it? "'Your husband's still abroad?' "'Yes. "'He's been gone rather a long time, hasn't he, Mrs. Ramsay? "'And gone rather a long way. "'What do you know about it?' "'Well, he's gone beyond the Iron Curtain, hasn't he?' "'She was silent for a moment or two, "'and then she said in a quiet, toneless voice, "'Yes, yes, that's quite right. "'Did you know he was going?' "'More or less.' "'She paused a minute and then said, "'He wanted me to join him there.' Had he been thinking of it for some time? I suppose so. He didn't tell me until lately. You're not in sympathy with his views? I was once, I suppose. But you must know that already. You check up pretty thoroughly on things like that, don't you? Go back into the past, find out who was a fellow traveller, who was a party member, all that sort of thing. You might be able to give us information that would be very useful to us, I said. She shook her head. No, I can't do that. Uh, I don't mean that I won't. You see, he never told me anything definite. I didn't want to know. I was sick and tired of the whole thing. When Michael told me that he was leaving this country, clearing out and going to Moscow, it didn't really startle me. I had to decide, then, what I wanted to do. And you decided you were not sufficiently in sympathy with your husband's aims. No, I wouldn't put it like that at all. My view is entirely personal. I believe it always is with women in the end, unless, of course, one is a fanatic. And then women can be very fanatical, but I wasn't. I've never been anything more than mildly left-wing. 
Was your husband mixed up in the Larkin business? I don't know. I suppose he might have been. He never told me anything or spoke to me about it. She looked at me suddenly with more animation. We'd better get it quite clear, Mr. Lamb, or Mr. Wolf in Lamb's clothing, or whatever you are. I loved my husband. I might have been fond enough of him to go with him to Moscow, whether I agreed with what his politics were or not. He wanted me to bring the boys. I didn't want to bring the boys. It was as simple as that, and so I decided I'd have to stay with them. Whether I shall ever see Michael again or not, I don't know. He's got to choose his way of life, and I've got to choose mine. But I did know one thing quite definitely. After he talked about it to me, I wanted the boys brought up here in their own country. They're English. I want them to be brought up as ordinary English boys. I see. And that, I think, is all, said Mrs. Ramsay as she got up. There was now a sudden decision in her manner. It must have been a very hard choice, I said gently. I'm very sorry for you. I was, too. Perhaps the real sympathy in my voice got through to her. She smiled very slightly. Perhaps you really are. I suppose in your job you have to try and get more or less under people's skins, know what they're feeling and thinking. It's been rather a knockout blow for me, but I'm over the worst of it. I've got to make plans now, what to do, where to go, whether to stay here or go somewhere else. I shall have to get a job. I used to do secretarial work once. Probably I'll take a refresher course in shorthand and typing. Well, don't go and work for the Cavendish Bureau, I said. Why not? Girls who are employed there seem to have rather unfortunate things happen to them. If you think I know anything at all about that, you're wrong. I don't. I wished her luck and went. I hadn't learned anything from her. I hadn't really thought I should. But one has to tidy up the loose ends. Going out of the gate, I almost cannoned into Mrs. McNaughton. She was carrying a shopping bag and seemed very wobbly on her feet. Let me, I said, and took it from her. She was inclined to clutch it from me at first, then she leaned her head forward, peering at me, and relaxed her grip. You are the young man from the police, she said. I didn't recognize you at first. I carried the shopping bag to her front door, and she teetered beside me. The shopping bag was unexpectedly heavy. I wondered what was in it. Pounds of potatoes. Don't ring, she said. The door isn't locked. Nobody's door ever seemed to be locked in Wilbraham Crescent. And how are you getting on with things, she asked chattily. He seems to have married very much below him. I didn't know what she was talking about. Who did? I, I've, I, I've been away, I explained. Oh, I see. Shadowing someone, I suppose. I meant that Mrs. Rival. I went to the inquest. Such a common-looking woman. I must say she didn't seem much upset by her husband's death. Well, she hadn't seen him for fifteen years, I explained. Angus and I have been married for twenty years, she sighed. <sighs> it's a long time. And so much gardening now that he isn't at the university. It makes it difficult to know what to do with oneself. At that moment, Mr. McNaughton, spade in hand, came round the corner of the house. Oh, you're back, my dear. Let me take the things. Just put it in the kitchen, said Mrs. McNaughton to me swiftly. Her elbow nudged me. Just the cornflakes and the eggs and the melon, she said to her husband, smiling brightly. I deposited the bag on the kitchen table. It clinked. Cornflakes, my foot. I let my spy's instincts take over. Under a camouflage of sheet gelatine were three bottles of whisky. I understood why Mrs. McNaughton was sometimes so bright and garrulous, and why she was occasionally a little unsteady on her feet, and possibly why McNaughton had resigned his chair. It was a morning for neighbours. I met Mr. Bland as I was going along the crescent towards Albany Road. Mr. Bland seemed in very good form. He recognized me at once. How are you? How's crime? Got your dead body identified, is he? Seems to have treated that wife of his rather badly. By the way, excuse me, you're not one of the locals, are you? I said evasively I'd come down from London. So the yard was interested, was it? Well, I drew the word out in a non-committal way. I understand I mustn't tell tales out of school. <laughs> you, um, you weren't at the inquest, sir? I said I'd been abroad. So have I, my boy, so have I. He winked at me. Gay pair. I asked, winking back. I oh, wish it had been. No, only a day trip to Boulogne. <laughs> he dug me in the side with his elbow. 
quite like Mrs. McNaughton. Didn't take the wife. <laughs> Teamed up with a very nice little bit. <laughs> Blonde. <laughs> quite a hot number. Business trip, I said. We both laughed like men of the world. He went on towards number 61, and I walked on towards Albany Road. I was dissatisfied with myself. As Poirot had said, there should have been more to be got out of the neighbours. It was positively unnatural that nobody should have seen anything. Perhaps Hardcastle had asked the wrong questions, but could I think of any better ones? As I turned into Albany Road, I made a mental list of questions, and it went something like this. Mr. Curry, or Castleton, had been doped. When? Mr. Curry, or Castleton, had been killed. Where? Mr. Curry, or Castleton, had been taken to number 19. How? Somebody must have seen something. Who? Somebody must have seen something. What? I turned to the left again. Now I was walking along Wilbraham Crescent, just as I'd walked on September the 9th. Should I call on Miss Pebmarsh? Ring the bell and say... Well, what should I say? Call on Miss Waterhouse? But what on earth could I say to her? Mrs. Hemming, perhaps. It wouldn't much matter what one said to Mrs. Hemming. She wouldn't be listening, and what she said, however haphazard and irrelevant, might lead to something. I walked along, mentally noting the numbers as I had before. Had the late Mr. Curry come along here, also noting numbers, until he came to the number he meant to visit? Wilbraham Crescent had never looked primmer. I almost found myself exclaiming in Victorian fashion, Oh, if these stones could speak! It was a favourite quotation in those days, so it seemed. But stones don't speak. No more do bricks and mortar, nor even plaster, nor stucco. Wilbraham Crescent remained silently itself. Old-fashioned, aloof, rather shabby, and not given to conversation. Disapproving, I was sure, of itinerant prowlers who didn't even know what they were looking for. There were few people about. A couple of boys on bicycles passed me, two women with shopping bags. The houses themselves might have been embalmed like mummies for all the signs of life there were in them. I knew why that was. It was already, or close upon, the sacred hour of one, an hour sanctified by English traditions to the consuming of a midday meal. In one or two houses I could see through the uncurtained windows a group of one or two people round a dining table, but even that was exceedingly rare. Either the windows were discreetly screened with nylon netting, as opposed to the once popular Nottingham lace, or, which was far more probable, anyone who was at home was eating in the modern kitchen, according to the custom of the 1960s. It was, I reflected, a perfect hour of day for a murder. Had the murderer thought of that, I wondered? Was it part of the murderer's plan? I came at last to number nineteen. Like so many other moronic members of the populace, I stood and stared. There was by now no other human being in sight. No neighbours, I said sadly. No intelligent onlookers. I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder. I'd been wrong. There was a neighbour here, all right, a very useful neighbour, if the neighbour had only been able to speak. I'd been leaning against the post of number twenty, and the same large orange cat I'd seen before was sitting on the gatepost. I stopped and exchanged a few words with him, first detaching his playful claw from my shoulder. If cats could speak, I offered him as a conversational opening. The orange cat opened his mouth and gave a loud, melodious meow. I know you can, I said. I know you can speak just as well as I can, but you're not speaking my language. Were you sitting here that day? Did you see who went into that house or came out of it? Do you know all about what happened? Hmm? I wouldn't put it past you, puss. The cat took my remark in poor part. He turned his back on me and began to switch his tail. I'm sorry, Your Majesty, I said. He gave me a cold look over his shoulder and started industriously to wash himself. Neighbours, I reflected bitterly. There was no doubt about it. Neighbours were in short supply in Wilbraham Crescent. What I wanted, what Hardcastle wanted, was some nice, gossipy, prying, peering old lady with time hanging heavy on her hands, always hoping to look out and see something scandalous. The trouble is that that kind of old lady seems to have died out nowadays. 
They're all sitting grouped together in old ladies' homes with every comfort for the aged, or crowding up hospitals where beds are needed urgently for the really sick. The lame and the halt and the old didn't live in their own houses any more, tended by a faithful domestic or by some half-witted poor relation lad of a good home. It was a serious setback to criminal investigation. I looked across the road. Why couldn't there be any neighbours there? Why couldn't there be a neat row of houses facing me instead of that great, inhuman-looking concrete block? A kind of human beehive, no doubt, tenanted by worker bees who were out all day and only came back in the evening to wash their smalls or make up their faces and go out to meet their young men. By contrast with the inhumanity of that block of flats, I began almost to have a kindly feeling for the faded Victorian gentility of Wilbraham Crescent. My eye was caught by a flash of light somewhere halfway up the building. It puzzled me. I stared up. Yes, there it came again. An open window and someone looking through it. A face slightly obliterated by something that was being held up to it. The flash of light came again. I dropped a hand into my pocket. I keep a good many things in my pockets, things that may be useful. You'd be surprised at what is useful sometimes. A little adhesive tape. A few quite innocent-looking instruments which are quite capable of opening most locked doors. A tin of grey powder labelled something which it isn't. And an insufflator to use with it. And one or two other little gadgets which most people wouldn't recognise for what they are. Amongst other things, I had a pocket bird watcher. Not a high-powered one, but just good enough to be useful. I took this out and raised it to my eye. There was a child at the window. I could see a long plait of hair lying over one shoulder. She had a pair of small opera glasses, and she was studying me with what might have been flattering attention. As there was nothing else for her to look at, however, it might not be as flattering as it seemed. At that moment, however, there was another midday distraction in Wilbraham Crescent. A very old Rolls-Royce came with dignity along the road, driven by a very elderly chauffeur. He looked dignified, but rather disgusted with life. He passed me with the solemnity of a whole procession of cars. My child observer, I noticed, was now training her opera glasses on him. I stood there, thinking. It's always my belief that if you wait long enough, you're bound to have some stroke of luck something that you can't count upon and that you would never have thought of, but which just happens. Was it possible that this might be mine? Looking up again at the big square block, I noted carefully the position of the particular window I was interested in, counting from it to each end and up from the ground. Third floor. Then I walked along the street till I came to the entrance to the block of flats. It had a wide carriage drive sweeping round the block with neatly spaced flower beds at strategic positions in the grass. It's always well, I find, to go through all the motions, so I stepped off the carriage drive towards the block, looked up over my head as though startled, bent down to the grass, pretended to hunt about, and finally straightened up, apparently transferring something from my hand to my pocket. Then I walked round the block until I came to the entrance. At most times of the day I should think there was a porter here, but between the sacred hour of one and two the entrance hall was empty. There was a bell with a large sign above it saying, Porter, but I didn't ring it. There was an automatic lift, and I went to it and pressed a button for the third floor. After that I had to check things pretty carefully. It looks simple enough from the outside to place one particular room, but the inside of a building is confusing. However, I've had a good deal of practice at that sort of thing in my time, and I was fairly sure that I'd got the right door. The number on it, for better or worse, was number 77. Well, I thought, sevens are lucky. Here goes. I pressed the bell and stood back to await events. Chapter 25 Colin Lamb's Narrative I had to wait just a minute or two, then the door opened. A big, blonde, Nordic girl with a flushed face and wearing gay-coloured clothing looked at me inquiringly. Her hands had been hastily wiped, but there were traces of flour on them, and there was a slight smear of flour on her nose, so it was easy for me to guess what she'd been doing. "'Excuse me,' I said, "'but you have a little girl here, I think. She dropped something out of the window.' She smiled at me encouragingly. 
The English language was not as yet her strong point. I'm, I'm sorry, what you say? A child here, a, a little girl? Yes, yes, she nodded. Uh, dropped something out of the window. Here I did a little gesticulation. I picked it up and brought it here. I held out an open hand. In it was a silver fruit knife. She looked at it without recognition. I do not think... That I have not seen... You're busy cooking, I said sympathetically. Yes, yes, I cook. That is so, she nodded vigorously. I don't want to disturb you, I said. If you let me just take it to her. Excuse? My meaning seemed to come to her. She led the way across the hall and opened a door. It led into a pleasant sitting-room. By the window a couch had been drawn up, and on it there was a child of about nine or ten years old with a leg done up in plaster. This gentleman, he say, uh, you, you, you drop... At this moment, rather fortunately, a strong smell of burning came from the kitchen. My guide uttered an exclamation of dismay. Excuse, please, please excuse. You go along, I said heartily. I can manage this. And she fled with alacrity. I entered the room, shut the door behind me, and came across to the couch. How do you do? I said. The child said, How do you do? And proceeded to sum me up with a long, penetrating glance that almost unnerved me. She was rather a plain child, with straight, mousy hair arranged in two plaits. She had a bulging forehead, a sharp chin, and a pair of very intelligent grey eyes. I'm Colin Lamb, I said. What's your name? She gave me the information promptly. Geraldine Mary Alexandra Brown. Dear me, I said, that's quite a bit of a name. What do they call you? Geraldine, sometimes Jerry, but I don't like that, and Daddy doesn't approve of abbreviations. One of the great advantages of dealing with children is that they have their own logic. Anyone of adult years would at once have asked me what I wanted. Geraldine was quite ready to enter into conversation without resorting to foolish questions. She was alone and bored, and the onset of any kind of visitor was an agreeable novelty. Until I proved myself a dull and unamusing fellow, she would be quite ready to converse. Your daddy's out, I suppose, I said. She replied with the same promptness and fullness of detail which she'd already shown. Cartinghaven Engineering Works, Beaverbridge, she said. It's fourteen and three-quarter miles from here, exactly. And your mother? Mummy's dead, said Geraldine, with no diminution of cheerfulness. She died when I was a baby, two months old. She was in a plane coming from France. It crashed. Everyone was killed. She spoke with a certain satisfaction, and I perceived that, to a child, if her mother is dead, it reflects a certain kudos if she's been killed in a complete and devastating accident. I see, I said. So you've... I looked towards the door. That's Ingrid. She comes from Norway. She's only been here a fortnight. She doesn't know any English to speak of yet. I'm teaching her English. And she's teaching you Norwegian? Not very much, said Geraldine. Do you like her? Yes, she's all right. The things she cooks are rather odd sometimes. Do you know, she likes eating raw fish. I've eaten raw fish in Norway, I said. It's very good sometimes. Geraldine looked extremely doubtful about that. She's trying to make a treacle tart today, she said. Oh, that sounds good. Mm, yes, I like treacle tart, and she added politely. Have you come to lunch? Not exactly. As a matter of fact, I was passing down below out there, and I think you dropped something out of the window. Me? Yes, I advanced the silver fruit knife. Geraldine looked at it, at first suspiciously, and then with signs of approval. It's rather nice, she said. What is it? It's a fruit knife. I opened it. Oh, I see. You mean you can peel apples with it and things like that? Yes. Geraldine sighed. It's not mine. I didn't drop it. What made you think I did? Well, you were looking out of the window. I look out of the window most of the time, said Geraldine. I fell down and broke my leg, you see. Hard luck. Yes, wasn't it? I didn't break it in a very interesting way, though. I was getting out of a bus and it went on suddenly. It hurt rather at first and it ached a bit, but it doesn't now. Must be rather dull for you, I said. Yes, it is, but Daddy brings me things. Plasticine, you know, and books and crayons and jigsaw puzzles and things like that. But you get tired of doing things, so I spend a lot of time looking out of the window with these. She produced with enormous pride a small pair of opera glasses. May I look, I said. I took them from her, adjusted them to my eyes, and looked out of the window. They're jolly good, I said appreciatively. They were indeed excellent. Geraldine's daddy, if it had been he who supplied them, had not spared expense. It was astonishing how clearly you could see number 19, Wilbraham Crescent, and its neighbouring houses. I handed them back to her. They're excellent, I said. 
First class. They're proper ones, said Geraldine, with pride. Not just for babies and pretending. No, I can see that. I keep a little book, said Geraldine, and she showed me. I write down things in it and the times. It's like train spotting, she added. I've got a cousin called Dick, and he does train spotting. We do motor car numbers, too. You know, you start at one and see how far you can get. It's rather a good sport, I said. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, there aren't many cars come down this road, so I've rather given that up for the time being. I suppose you must know all about those houses down there, who lives in them, and all that sort of thing. I threw it out casually enough, but Geraldine was quick to respond. Oh, yes. Of course, I don't know their real names, so I have to give them names of my own. Well, that must be rather fun, I said. That's the Marchioness of Carabas down there, said Geraldine, pointing. That one with all the untidy trees, you know, like Puss in Boots. She has masses and masses of cats. I was talking to one just now, I said, an orange one. Yes, I saw you, said Geraldine. You must be very sharp, I said. I don't expect you miss much, do you? Geraldine smiled in a pleased way. Ingrid opened the door and came in breathless. You are all right, yes? We're quite all right, said Geraldine firmly. You needn't worry, Ingrid. She nodded violently and pantomimed with her hands. You go back. You cook. Very well, I go. It is nice that you have a, um, a, a visitor. She gets nervous when she cooks, explained Geraldine, when she's trying anything new, I mean. And sometimes we have meals very late because of that. I'm glad you've come. It's nice to have someone to distract you, then you don't think about being hungry. Tell me more about the people in the houses there, I said, and what you see. Who lives in the next house, the, the neat one? Oh, there's a blind woman there. She's quite blind, and yet she walks just as well as though she could see. The porter told me that. Harry. He's very nice, Harry is. He tells me a lot of things. He told me about the murder. The murder, I said, sounding suitably astonished. Geraldine nodded. Her eyes shone with importance at the information she was about to convey. There was a murder in that house. I practically saw it. How oh, very interesting. Yes, isn't it? I've never seen a murder before. I mean, I've never seen a place where a murder happened. What did you um, see? Well, there wasn't very much going on just then. You know, it's rather an empty time of day. The exciting thing was when somebody came rushing out of the house screaming, and then, of course, I knew something must have happened. Who was screaming? Just a woman. She was quite young, ra rather pretty, really. She came out of the door, and she screamed, and she screamed, and there was a young man coming along the road. She came out of the gate and sort of clutched him, li like this. And she made a motion with her arms. She fixed me with a sudden glance. He looked rather like you. I must have a double, I said lightly. What happened next? This is very exciting. Well, he sort of plumped her down, you know, on the ground there, and then he went back into the house, and the emperor, that, that's the orange cat, I always call him the emperor because he looks so proud, he stopped washing himself and he looked quite surprised. And then Miss Pikestaff came out of her house. That, that's the one there, number 18. She came out and stood on the step staring. Miss Pikestaff. And well, I call her Miss Pikestaff because she's so plain. She's got a brother and she bullies him. Go on, I said with interest. And then all sorts of things happened. The man came out of the house again. Are you sure it wasn't you? I'm a very ordinary-looking chap, I said modestly. There are lots like me. Yes, I suppose that's true, said Geraldine, somewhat unflatteringly. Well, anyway, this man, he went off down the road and telephoned from the call box down there. And presently police began arriving. Her eyes sparkled. Lots of police. And they took the dead body away in a sort of ambulance thing. Of course, there were lots of people by that time staring, you know. I saw Harry there, too. That, that's the porter from these flats. He, he told me about it afterwards. Did he tell you who was murdered? He just said it was a man. Nobody knew his name. It's all very interesting, I said. I prayed fervently that Ingrid would not choose this moment to come in again with a delectable treacle tart or other delicacy. But go back a little, do. <clears throat> Tell me earlier. Did you see this man, the man who was murdered? Did you see him arrive at the house? No, I didn't. I suppose he must have been there all along. You mean he lived there? Oh, no, nobody lives there except Miss Pebmarsh. So you know her real name. Oh, yes, it was in the papers about the murder. And the, the screaming girl was called Sheila Webb. Harry told me that the man who was murdered was called Mr. Curry. <laughs> That's a funny name, isn't it? Like the thing you eat. And there was a second murder, you know. Not the same day. Later in the telephone box down the road. I can see it from here just, but I have to get my head right out of the window and turn it round. 
Well, of course, I, I didn't really see it, because, I mean, if I'd known it was going to happen, I would have looked out. But, of course, I didn't know it was going to happen, so I didn't. And there were a lot of people that morning just standing there in the street looking at the house opposite. I think that's rather stupid, don't you? Yes, I said, very stupid. Here Ingrid made her appearance once more. I come soon, she said reassuringly. I come very soon now. She departed again. Geraldine said, We don't really want her. She gets worried about meals. Of course, this is the only one she has to cook except breakfast. Daddy goes down to the restaurant in the evening and he has something sent up for me from there. Just fish or something. Not a real dinner. Her voice sounded wistful. What time do you usually have your lunch, Geraldine? My dinner, you mean. This is my dinner. I don't have dinner in the evening. It's supper. Well, I really have my dinner at any time Ingrid happens to have cooked it. She's rather funny about time. She has to get breakfast ready at the right time because Daddy gets so cross. But midday dinner we have any time. Sometimes we have it at twelve o'clock, and sometimes I don't get it till two. Ingrid says you don't have meals at a particular time. You just have them when they're ready. Well, it's an easy idea, I said. What time did you have your lunch, dinner, I mean, on the day of the murder? Oh, that was one of the twelve o'clock days. You see, Ingrid goes out that day. She goes to the cinema or to have her hair done, and, and Mrs. Perry comes and keeps me company. She's terrible, really. She pats one. Pats one, I said, slightly puzzled. You know, on the head, says things like, Dear little girlie. She's not, said Geraldine, the kind of person you can have any proper conversation with. But she brings me sweets and that sort of thing. How old are you, Geraldine? I'm ten. Ten and three months. You seem to me very good at intelligent conversation, I said. That's because I have to talk to Daddy a lot, said Geraldine seriously. So you had your dinner early on that day of the murder? Yes, so Ingrid could get washed up and go off just after one. Then you were looking out of the window that morning, watching people. Oh, yes, part of the time. Earlier, about ten o'clock, I was doing a crossword puzzle. I've been wondering whether you could possibly have seen Mr. Curry arriving at the house. Geraldine shook her head. No, I didn't. It is rather odd, I agree. Well, perhaps he got there quite early. He didn't go to the front door and ring the bell. I'd have seen him. Perhaps he came in through the garden. I mean, through the other side of the house. Oh, no, said Geraldine. It backs on other houses. They wouldn't like anyone coming through their garden. Oh, no, I suppose they wouldn't. I wish I knew what he'd looked like, said Geraldine. Well, he was quite old. About sixty. He was clean-shaven, and he had on a dark grey suit. Geraldine shook her head. It sounds terribly ordinary, she said with disapprobation. Anyway, I said, I suppose it's difficult for you to remember one day from another when you're lying here and always looking. It's not at all difficult, she rose to the challenge. I can tell you everything about that morning. I know when Mrs. Crabbe came and when she left. That's the daily cleaning woman, is it? Yes, she scuttles, just like a crab. She's got a little boy. Sometimes she brings him with her, but she didn't that day. And then Miss Pebmarsh goes out about ten o'clock. She goes to teach children at a blind school. Mrs. Crabbe goes away about twelve. Sometimes she has a parcel with her that she didn't have when she came. Bits of butter, I expect, and cheese, because Miss Pebmarsh can't see. I know particularly well what happened that day, because, you see, Ingrid and I were having a little quarrel, so she wouldn't talk to me. I'm teaching her English, and she wanted to know how to say, until we meet again. She had to tell it me in German. Auf Wiedersehen. I know that because I once went to Switzerland and people said that there. And they said Grüß Gott too. That's rude if you say it in English. So what did you tell Ingrid to say? Geraldine began to laugh, a deep, malicious chuckle. She started to speak, but her chuckles prevented her. But at last she got it out. I told her to say, get the hell out of here. <laughs> So she said, she said it to Miss Bolstrode next door, and Miss Bolstrode was furious. So Ingrid found out and was very cross with me, and we didn't make friends until nearly tea time the next day. I digested this information. End of disc five. Disc six. So. You concentrated on your opera glasses, Geraldine nodded. So that's how I know Mr. Curry didn't go in by the front door. I think perhaps he got in somehow in the night and hid in an attic. Do you think that's likely? I suppose anything really is possible, I said, but it doesn't seem to me very probable. No, said Geraldine. He would have got hungry, wouldn't he? And he couldn't have asked Miss Pebmarsh for breakfast, not if he was hiding from her. 
And nobody came to the house, I said. Nobody at all. Nobody in a car, a tradesman, callers. The grocer comes Mondays and Thursdays, said Geraldine, and the milk comes at half past eight in the morning. The child was a positive encyclopedia. The cauliflowers and things Miss Pebmarsh buys herself. Nobody called at all except the laundry. It was a new laundry, she added. A new laundry? Yes, it's usually the Southern Downs laundry. Most people have the Southern Downs. It was a new laundry that day, the Snowflake laundry. I've never seen the Snowflake laundry. They must have just started. I fought hard to keep any undue interest out of my voice. I didn't want to start her romancing. Did it deliver laundry or call for it, I asked. Deliver it, said Geraldine, in a great big basket, too, much bigger than the usual one. Did Miss Pebmarsh take it in? No, of course not. She'd gone out again. What time was this, Geraldine? One thirty-five, exactly, said Geraldine. I wrote it down, she added proudly. She motioned towards a small notebook, and opening it pointed with a rather dirty forefinger to an entry. One thirty-five, laundry came, number nineteen. You ought to be at Scotland Yard, I said. Do they have women detectives? I quite like that. I don't mean police women. I think police women are silly. You haven't told me exactly what happened when the laundry came. Nothing happened, said Geraldine. The driver got down, opened the van, took out this basket, and staggered along round the side of the house to the back door. I expect he couldn't get in. Miss Pebmarsh probably locks it, so he probably left it there and came back. What did he look like? Just ordinary, said Geraldine. Like me, I asked. Oh, no, <clears throat> much older than you, said Geraldine, but I didn't really see him properly because he drove up to the house this way. She pointed to the right. He drew up in front of nineteen, although he was on the wrong side of the road, but it doesn't matter in a street like this. And then he went in through the gate, bent over the basket. I could only see the back of his head, and when he came out again, he was rubbing his face. I expect he found it a bit hot and trying, carrying that basket. And then he drove off again? Yes. Why do you think it's so interesting? Well, I don't know. I said I thought perhaps he might have seen something interesting. Ingrid flung the door open. She was wheeling a trolley. We eat dinner now, she said, nodding brightly. Goody, said Geraldine. I'm starving. I got up. I must be going now, I said. Goodbye, Geraldine. Goodbye. Well, what about this thing? She picked up the fruit knife. It's not mine. Her voice became wistful. I wish it were. It looks as though it's nobody's in particular, doesn't it? Would that make it treasure trove, or whatever it is? Something of the kind, I said. I think you'd better hang on to it. That is, hang on to it until someone else claims it. But I don't think, I said truthfully, that anybody will. Get me an apple, Ingrid, said Geraldine. Apple? Pom! Apple! She did her linguistic best, and I left them to it. Chapter 26 Mrs. Rival pushed open the door of the peacock's arms and made a slightly unsteady progress towards the bar. She was murmuring under her breath. She was no stranger to this particular hostelry, and she was greeted quite affectionately by the barman. "'I'll do, Flo,' he said. "'How's tricks?' "'It's not right,' said Mrs. Rival. "'It's not fair. No, it's not right. I know what I'm talking about, Fred, and I say it's not right.' Well, "'Of course it isn't right,' said Fred soothingly. "'What is, I'd like to know. You want the usual, dear?' Mrs. Rival nodded assent. She paid and began to sip from her glass. Fred moved away to attend to another customer. Her drink cheered Mrs. Rival slightly. She still muttered under her breath, but with a more good-humoured expression. When Fred was near her once more, she addressed him again with a slightly softened manner. "'All the same, I'm not going to put up with it,' she said. "'No, I'm not. If there's one thing I can't bear, it's deceit. I don't stand for deceit. I never did.' "'Of course you didn't,' said Fred. He surveyed her with a practised eye. And a good few already, he thought to himself. Still, she can stand a couple more, I expect. Something's upset her. Deceit, said Mrs. Rival. Prevary... Well, pre well, you know the word I mean. Sure, I know, said Fred. He turned to greet another acquaintance. The unsatisfactory performance of certain dogs came under review. Mrs. Rival continued to murmur. I don't like it, and I won't stand for it. I shall say so. People can't think they can go round treating me like that. No, indeed, they can't. I mean, it's not right, and if you don't stick up for yourself, who'll stick up for you? Give me another, dearie, she added in a louder voice, and Fred obliged. I should go home after that one, if I were you, he advised. 
He wondered what had upset the old girl so much. She was usually fairly even-tempered. A friendly soul, always good for a laugh. It'll get me in bad, Fred, you see, she said. When people ask you to do a thing, they should tell you all about it. They should tell you what it means and what they're doing. Liars, dirty liars, that's what I say, and I won't stand for it. I should cut along home if I were you, said Fred, as he observed a tear about to trickle down the mascarid splendour. Going to come on to rain soon, it is. Rain hard, too. Spoil that pretty hat of yours. Mrs. Rival gave one faint, appreciative smile. I always was fond of cornflowers, she said. Oh, dear me, I don't know what to do, I'm sure. I should go home and have a nice kip, said the barman kindly. Well, perhaps, but come on now, you don't want to spoil that hat. That's very true, said Mrs. Rival. Yes, that's very true. That's a very profound... Profu no, I don't mean that. What do I mean? Profound remark of yours, Fred. Thank you very much. You're welcome, said Fred. Mrs. Rival slipped down from her high seat and went not too steadily towards the door. "'Something seems to have upset old Float a night, said one of the customers. Oh, "'She's usually a cheerful bird, but we all have our ups and downs,' said another man, a gloomy-looking individual. "'If anyone had told me,' said the first man, "'that Jerry Granger had come in fifth way behind Queen Caroline, I wouldn't have believed it. "'If you ask me, there's been hanky-panky. "'Racing's not straight now, they dope the horses, they do. "'All of them.' "'Mrs. Rival had come out of the peacock's arms.' She looked up uncertainly at the sky. Yes, perhaps it was going to rain. She walked along the street, hurrying slightly, took a turn to the left, a turn to the right, and stopped before a rather dingy-looking house. As she took out a key and went up the front steps, a voice spoke from the area below, and a head poked round a corner of the door and looked up at her. "'Gentlemen waiting for you upstairs for me,' Mrs. Rival sounded faintly surprised. "'Well, if you call him a gentleman, well-dressed and all that, but not quite Lord Algernon Vere de Vere, I would say.' Mrs. Rival succeeded in finding the keyhole, turned the key in it, and entered. The house smelled of cabbage and fish and eucalyptus. The latter smell was almost permanent in this particular hall. Mrs. Rival's landlady was a great believer in taking care of her chest in winter weather, and began the good work in mid-September. Mrs. Rival climbed the stairs, aiding herself with the banisters. She pushed open the door on the first floor and went in. Then she stopped dead and took a step backwards. Oh, she said, it's you. Detective Inspector Hardcastle rose from the chair where he was sitting. Good evening, Mrs. Rival. What do you want? asked Mrs. Rival, with less finesse than she would normally have shown. Well, I had to come up to London on duty, said Inspector Hardcastle, and there were just one or two things I thought I'd like to take up with you, so I came along on the chance of finding you. The, uh, the woman downstairs seemed to think you might be in before long. Oh, said Mrs. Rival. Well, I don't see... Uh, well, Inspector Hardcastle pushed forward a chair. Do sit down, he said politely. Their positions might have been reversed, he the host and she the guest. But Mrs. Rival sat down. She stared at him very hard. "'What did you mean by one or two things?' she said. "'Little points,' said Inspector Hardcastle. "'Little points that come up.' "'You mean about Harry?' "'That's right. "'Now, look here,' said Mrs. Rival, a slight belligerence coming into her voice. At the same time, as an aroma of spirits came clearly to Inspector Hardcastle's nostrils, "'I've had Harry!' I don't want to think of him any more. I came forward, didn't I, when I saw his picture in the paper? I came and told you about him. It's all a long time ago, and I don't want to be reminded of it. There's nothing more I can tell you. I've told you everything I could remember, and now I don't want to hear any more about it. It's quite a small point, said Inspector Hardcastle. He spoke gently and apologetically. Oh, very well, said Mrs. Rival, rather ungraciously. What is it? Let's have it. You recognise the man as your husband, or the man you'd gone through a form of marriage with about fifteen years ago. That's right, is it not? I should have thought that by this time you would have known exactly how many years ago it was. Sharper than I thought, Inspector Hardcastle said to himself. But he went on. Yes, you're quite right there. We looked it up. You were married on May the 15th, 1948. It's always unlucky to be a May bride, so they say, said Mrs. Rival gloomily. It didn't bring me any luck. In spite of the years that have elapsed, you were able to identify your husband quite easily. Mrs. Rival moved with some slight uneasiness. He hadn't aged much, she said. Always took care of himself, Harry did. And you were able to give us some additional identification. You wrote to me, I think, about a scar. That's right. 
Behind his left ear it was. Here. Mrs. Rival raised a hand and pointed to the place. Behind his left ear, Hardcastle stressed the word. Will, she looked momentarily doubtful. Yes, well, well, I think so. Uh, yes, I'm sure it was. Of course, one never does know one's left from one's right in a hurry, does one? But yes, it was the left side of his neck. Here, she placed her hand on the same spot again. And he did it shaving, you say. That's right. The dog jumped up on him. Very bouncy dog we had at the time. He kept rushing in, affectionate dog. He jumped up on Harry, and he got the razor in his hand, and it went in deep. It bled a lot. It healed up, but he never lost the mark. She was speaking now with more assurance. That's a very valuable point, Mrs. Rival. After all, one man sometimes looks very like another man, especially when a good many years have passed. But to find a man closely resembling your husband who has a scar in the identical place, well... That makes the identification very nice and safe, doesn't it? It seems that we really have something to go on. I'm glad you're pleased, said Mrs. Rival. And this accident with the razor happened when? Mrs. Rival considered a moment. It must have been about, oh, about six months after we were married. Yes, that was it. We got the dog that summer, I remember. So it took place about October or November 1948. Is that right? That's right. And after your husband left you in 1951, he didn't so much leave me as I turned him out, said Mrs. Rival with dignity, quite so, whichever way you like to put it. Anyway, after you turned your husband out in 1951, you never saw him again until you saw his picture in the paper, hmm? Yes, that's what I told you. And you're quite sure about that, Mrs. Rival? Of course I'm sure. I never set eyes on Harry Castleton since that day until I saw him dead. That's odd, you know, said Inspector Hardcastle. That's very odd. Why? What do you mean? Well, it's a very curious thing, scar tissue. Of course, it wouldn't mean much to you or me, a scar's a scar, but doctors can tell a lot from it. They can tell roughly, you know, how long a man has had a scar. I don't know what you're getting at. Well, simply this, Mrs. Rival. According to our police surgeon, and to another doctor whom we consulted, that scar tissue behind your husband's ear shows very clearly that the wound in question could not be older than about five to six years ago. Nonsense, said Mrs. Rival. I don't believe it. I... Nobody can tell. Anyway, that wasn't when... So you see, proceeded Hardcastle in a smooth voice, if that wound made a scar only five or six years ago, it means that if the man was your husband, he had no scar at the time when he left you in 1951. Perhaps he didn't. But anyway, it was Harry. But you've never seen him since, Mrs. Rival. So if you've never seen him since, how would you know that he'd acquired a scar five or six years ago? You mix me up, said Mrs. Rob. You mix me up badly. Perhaps it wasn't as long ago as 1948. You can't remember all these things. Anyway, Harry had that scar, and I know it. I see, said Inspector Hardcastle, and he rose to his feet. I think you'd better think over that statement of yours very carefully, Mrs. Rival. You don't want to get into trouble, you know. How do you mean, get into trouble? Well, Inspector Hardcastle spoke almost apologetically. Perjury. Perjury? Me? Yes, it's quite a serious offence in law, you know. You could get into trouble, even go to prison. Of course, you've not been on oath in a coroner's court, but you may have to swear to this evidence of yours in a proper court sometime. Then, well, I'd like you to think it over very carefully, Mrs. Rival. It may be that somebody suggested to you that you should tell us this story about the scar. Mrs. Rival got up. She drew herself to her full height. Her eyes flashed. She was at that moment almost magnificent. I never heard such nonsense in my life, she said. Absolute nonsense. I try and do my duty. I come and help you. I tell you all I can remember. If I've made a mistake, I'm sure it's natural enough. After all, I meet a good many, well, well, gentlemen friends, and one may get things a little wrong sometimes, but I don't think I did make a mistake. That man was Harry, and Harry had a scar behind his left ear. I'm quite sure of that. Now, perhaps, Inspector Hardcastle, you go away, instead of coming here and insinuating that I've been telling lies. Inspector Hardcastle got up promptly. Good night, Mrs. Rival, he said. Just think it over, that's all. Mrs. Rival tossed her head. Hardcastle went out of the door. With his departure, Mrs. Rival's attitude altered immediately. 
The fine defiance of her attitude collapsed. She looked frightened and worried. "'Getting me into this,' she murmured. "'Getting me into this. I'll, 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 I'll not go on with it. I, I'm not going to get into trouble for anybody telling me things, lying to me, deceiving me. It's monstrous, quite monstrous. I shall say so.' She walked up and down unsteadily, then, finally making up her mind, she took an umbrella from the corner and went out again. She walked along to the end of the street, hesitated at a call box, then went on to a post office. She went in there, asked for change, and went into one of the call boxes. She dialed directory and asked for a number. She stood there waiting till the call came through. "'Go ahead, please. Your party is on the line,' she spoke. "'Hello. Oh, it's you. Flo here. No, I know you told me not to, but I've had to. You've not been straight with me. You never told me what I was getting into. You just said it would be awkward for you if this man was identified. I didn't dream for a moment that I would get mixed up in a murder.' Well, of course you'd say that, but at any rate it wasn't what you told me. Yes, I do. I think you are mixed up in it in some way. Well, I'm, I'm not going to stand for it, I tell you. There's something about being an... Uh, an... Uh, an... Ex oh, you know the word I mean. Ac ac accessory, something like that. Uh, now, I always thought that was costume jewellery. Anyway, it's something like being a something after the fact. I'm, and I'm frightened, I tell you, telling me to write and tell them that bit about the scar. Now it seems he'd only got that scar a year or two ago, and he's me swearing he had it when he left me years ago. And that's... that's perjury. I might go to prison for it. Well, well it's no good you're trying to talk me round. No... "'Obliging someone's one thing. "'Well, I know, I know you paid me for it, "'and not very much either. "'Well, well, all, all right, I'll listen to you, but I'm not going to... "'All right, all right, I'll keep quiet. "'What do you say? How much? "'That's a lot of money. "'How do I know that you've got it even... "'Well, yes, of course it would make a difference. "'You swear you didn't have anything to do with it, "'I mean, with, with killing anyone. "'No, well, I'm sure you wouldn't.' No, of course. No, I see that. Sometimes you get mixed up with a crowd of people, and they go further than you would, and it's not your fault. Oh, you, uh, you, you always make things sound so plausible. You always did. Well, all right, I'll think it over, but it's got to be soon. Tomorrow? What time? Yes. Yes, I'll come, but no check. Might bounce. I don't know, really, that I ought to go on getting myself mixed up in things, even though... No, all right. Well, if you say so. Well, I didn't mean to be so nasty about it. All right, then. She came out of the post office, weaving from side to side of the pavement and smiling to herself. It was worth risking a little trouble with the police for that amount of money. It would set her up nicely. And it wasn't very much risk, really. She'd only got to say she'd forgotten or couldn't remember. Lots of women couldn't remember things that had only happened a year ago. She'd say she got mixed up between Harry and another man. Oh, she could think up lots of things to say. Mrs. Rival was a naturally mercurial type. Her spirits rose as much now as they'd been depressed before. She began to think seriously and intently of the first things she would spend the money on. Chapter 27. Colin Lamb's Narrative "'You don't seem to have got much out of that Ramsay woman,' complained Colonel Beck. "'There wasn't much to get. "'Sure of that? Yes. "'She's not an active party. "'No.' Beck gave me a searching glance. "'Satisfied?' he asked. "'Not really. "'You hoped for more. It "'Doesn't fill the gap. "'Well, we'll have to look elsewhere. "'Give up Crescent, well. "'Yes. "'You're very monosyllabic. "'Got a hangover.' I'm no good at this job, I said slowly. Want me to pat you on the head and say, there, there. In spite of myself, I laughed. That's better, said Beck. Now then, <clears throat> what's it all about? Girl trouble, I suppose. I shook my head. Oh, it's been coming on for some time. As a matter of fact, I've noticed it, said Beck unexpectedly. The world's in a confusing state nowadays. Issues aren't clear as they used to be. When discouragement sets in, it's like dry rot. Whacking great mushrooms, bursting through the walls. If that's so, your usefulness to us is over. You've done some first-class work, boy, be content with that. Go back to those damned seaweeds of yours. He paused and said, You really like the beastly things, don't you? I find the whole subject passionately interesting. I should find it repulsive. Splendid variation in nature and the tastes, I mean. How's that 
patent murder of yours. I bet you the girl did it. You're wrong, I said. Beck shook his finger at me in an admonitory and avuncular manner. What I say to you is, be prepared. I don't mean it in the Boy Scout sense. I walked down Charing Cross Road, deep in thought. At the tube station I bought a paper. I read that a woman, supposed to have collapsed in the rush hour at Victoria Station yesterday, had been taken to hospital. On arrival there she was found to have been stabbed. She died without recovering consciousness. Her name was Mrs. Molina Rival. I rang Hardcastle. Yes, he said in answer to my questions, it's just as they say. His voice sounded hard and bitter. I went to see her the night before last. I told her a story about the scar just wouldn't gel, that the scar tissue was comparatively recent. Funny how people slip up just by trying to overdo things. Somebody paid that woman to identify the corpse as being that of her husband, who ran out on her years ago. Very well, she did it, too. I believed her, all right. And then whoever it was tried to be a little too clever. If she remembered that unimportant little scar as an afterthought, it would carry conviction and clinch the identification. If she'd plumped out with it straight away, it might have sounded a bit too glib. So Molina Rival was in it up to the neck. You know, I rather doubt that. Suppose an old friend or acquaintance goes to her and says, Look here, I'm in a bit of a spot. A chap I've had business dealings with has been murdered. If they identify him and all our dealings come to light, it'll be absolute disaster. But if you were to come along and say it's that husband of yours, Harry Castleton, who did a bunk years ago, then the whole case will peter out. Well, surely she'd jib at that. Say it was too risky, hmm? If so, that someone would say, what's the risk? At the worst, you've made a mistake. Any woman can make a mistake after fifteen years. And probably at that point a nice little sum would have been mentioned, and she says, OK, she'll be a sport and do it, with no suspicions. She wasn't a suspicious woman. Well, good Lord, Colin, every time we catch a murderer, there are people who've known him well and simply can't believe he could do anything like that. What happened when you went up to see her? I put the wind up her. After I left, she did what I expected she'd do, and tried to get in touch with the man or woman who'd got her into this. I had a tail on her, of course. She went to a post office, put through a call from an automatic call box. Unfortunately, it wasn't the box I'd expected her to use at the end of her own street. She had to get change. She came out of the call box looking pleased with herself. She was kept under observation, but nothing of interest happened until yesterday evening. She went to Victoria Station, took a ticket to Crowdean. It was half past six, the rush hour. She wasn't on her guard. She thought she was going to meet whoever it was at Crodine, but the cunning devil was a step ahead of her. Easiest thing in the world to gang up behind someone in a crowd and press the knife in. Don't suppose she even knew she'd been stabbed. People don't, you know. Remember that case of Barton in the Levity gang robbery? Walked the length of a street before he fell down dead. Just a sudden sharp pain, and you think you're all right again. But you're not. You're dead on your feet, although you don't know it. He finished up, damn and damn and damn. Have you checked on anybody? I had to ask. I couldn't help myself. His reply came swift and sharp. The Pebmarsh woman was in London yesterday. She did some business for the Institute, returned to Crodine by the 740 train. He paused. And Sheila Webb took up a typescript to check over with a foreign author who was in London on his way to New York. She left the Ritz Hotel at 5.30 at Prox and took in a cinema alone before returning. Look here, Hardcastle, I said. I've got something for you, vouched for by an eyewitness. A laundry van drew up at 19 Wilbraham Crescent at 1.35 on September the 9th. The man who drove it delivered a big laundry basket at the back door of the house. It was a particularly large laundry basket. Laundry? What laundry? The snowflake laundry, no? Not offhand. New laundries are always starting up. It's an ordinary sort of name for a laundry. Well, you check up. A man drove it, and a man took the basket into the house. Hardcastle's voice came suddenly, alert with suspicion. Are you making this up, Colin? No, I told you, I've got an eyewitness. Check up, Dick. Get on with it. I rang off before he could badger me further. I walked out from the box and looked at my watch. 
I had a good deal to do, and I wanted to be out of Hardcastle's reach whilst I did it. I had my future life to arrange. Chapter 28. Colin Lamb's Narrative. I arrived at Crodine at eleven o'clock at night, five days later. I went to the Clarendon Hotel, got a room, and went to bed. I'd been tired the night before, and I overslept. I woke up at a quarter to ten. I sent for coffee and toast and a daily paper. It came, and with it a large square note addressed to me with the words, By Hand, in the top left-hand corner. I examined it with some surprise. It was unexpected. The paper was thick and expensive, the superscription neatly printed. After turning it over and playing with it, I finally opened it. Inside was a sheet of paper. Printed on it in large letters were the words, Curlew Hotel, 1130, Room 413, Knock Three Times. I stared at it, turned it over in my hand, what was all this? I noted the room number, 413, the same as the clock's. A coincidence? Or not a coincidence? I had thoughts of ringing the Curlew Hotel. Then I thought of ringing Dick Hardcastle. I didn't do either. My lethargy was gone. I got up, shaved, washed, dressed, and walked along the front of the Curlew Hotel, and got there at the appointed time. The summer season was pretty well over now. There weren't many people about inside the hotel. I didn't make any inquiries at the desk. I went up in the lift to the fourth floor and walked along the corridor to number 413. I stood there for a moment or two, then, feeling a complete fool, I knocked three times. A voice said, Come in. I turned the handle. The door wasn't locked. I stepped inside and stopped dead. I was looking at the last person on earth I would have expected to see. Hercule Poirot sat facing me. He beamed at me. "'Une petite surprise, n'est-ce pas?' I said. "'But a pleasant one, I hope.' "'Poirot, you old fox,' I shouted. "'How did you get here?' "'I got here in a Daimler limousine. Most comfortable. "'But what are you doing here?' "'It was most vexing. "'They insisted, positively insisted, on the redecoration of my apartment. "'Imagine my difficulty. What can I do? Where can I go?' Lots of places, I said coldly. Possibly, but um, it is suggested to me by my doctor that the air of the sea will be good for me. One of those obliging doctors who finds out where his patient wants to go and advises him to go there. Was it you who sent me this? I brandished the letter I'd received. Naturally. Who else? Is it a coincidence that you have a room whose number is 413? It is not a coincidence. I asked for it specially. Why? Poirot put his head on one side and twinkled at me. It seemed to be appropriate. And knocking three times, I could not resist it. If I could have enclosed a sprig of rosemary, it would have been better still. I thought of cutting my finger and putting a blood-stained fingerprint on the door. But enough is enough. I might have got an infection. I suppose this is second childhood, I remarked coldly. I'll buy you a balloon and a woolly rabbit this afternoon. I do not think you enjoy my surprise. You expressed no joy, no delight at seeing me. Did you expect me to? Pourquoi pas? Come, <clears throat> let us be serious. Now that I have had my little piece of foolery, I hope to be of assistance. I have called up the chief constable who has been of the utmost amiability, and at this moment I await your friend, Detective Inspector Hardcastle. And what are you going to say to him? It was in my mind that we might all three engage in conversation. I looked at him and laughed. He might call it conversation, but I knew who was going to do the talking. Hercule Poirot. Hardcastle had arrived, and we'd had the introduction and the greetings, and we were now settled down in a companionable fashion, with Dick occasionally glancing surreptitiously at Poirot, with the air of a man at the zoo studying a new and surprising acquisition. I doubt if he'd ever met anyone quite like Hercule Poirot before. Finally, the amenities and politeness having been observed, Hardcastle cleared his throat and spoke. I suppose, Monsieur Poirot, he said cautiously, that you'll want to see, well, <clears throat> the whole set-up for yourself. It won't be exactly easy, he hesitated. The chief constable told me to do everything I could for you, but uh, you must appreciate that there are difficulties, questions that may be asked. 
objections. Still, as you've come down here specially, Poirot interrupted him with a touch of coldness. I came here, he said, because of the reconstruction and decoration of my apartment in London. I gave a hoarse laugh, and Poirot shot me a look of reproach. Monsieur Poirot doesn't have to go and see things, I said. He's always insisted that you can do it all from an armchair, but that's not quite true, is it, Poirot? Or why have you come here? Poirot replied with dignity. I said that it was not necessary to be the foxhound, the bloodhound, the tracking dog uh, running to and fro upon the scent, but I will admit that for the chase a dog is necessary. A retriever, my friend, a good retriever. He turned towards the inspector. One hand twirled his moustache in a satisfied gesture. Let me tell you, he said, that I am not like the English, obsessed with dogs. I personally can live without the dog, but I accept nevertheless your ideal of the dog. The man loves and respects his dog. He indulges him. He boasts of the intelligence and sagacity of his dog to his friends. Now, Figure to yourself, the opposite may also come to pass. The dog is fond of his master. He indulges that master. He, too, boasts of his master, boasts of his master's sagacity and intelligence. And as a man will rouse himself when he does not really want to go out and take his dog for a walk because the dog enjoys the walk so much, so will the dog endeavor to give his master what that master pines to have. It was so with my kind young friend Colin here. He came to see me not to ask for help with his own problem, that he was confident that he could solve for himself, and has, I gather, done so. No, he felt concerned that I was unoccupied and lonely, so he brought to me a problem that he felt would interest me and give me something to work upon. He challenged me with it, challenged me to do what I had so often told him it was possible to do, sit still in my chair and, in due course... Resolve that problem. It may be, I suspect it is, that there was a little malice, just a small harmless amount, behind that challenge. He wanted, let us say, to prove to me that it was not so easy after all. Mais oui, mon ami, it is true that you wanted to mock yourself at me just a little. I do not reproach you. All I say is, you did not know your Hercule Poirot. He thrust out his chest and twirled his moustaches. I looked at him and grinned affectionately. All right, then, I said. Give us the answer to the problem, if you know it. But of course I know it. Hardcastle stared at him incredulously. Are you saying you know who killed the man at 19 Wilbraham Crescent? Certainly. And also who killed Edna Britt? Of course. You know the identity of the dead man? I know who he must be. Hardcastle had a very doubtful expression on his face. Mindful of the chief constable, he remained polite, but there was scepticism in his voice. Excuse me, Monsieur Poirot, you claim that you know who killed three people, and why? Yes. You've got an open and shut case. That, no. All you mean is that you have a hunch, I said unkindly. I will not quarrel with you over a word, mon cher Colin. All I say is, I know. Hardcastle sighed. But you see, Monsieur Poirot, I have to have evidence. Naturally. But with the resources you have at your disposal, it will be possible for you, I think, to get that evidence. I'm not so sure about that. Come now, Inspector. If you know, really know, is not that the first step? Can you not nearly always go on from there? Not always, said Hardcastle with a sigh. There are men walking about today who ought to be in jail. They know it, and we know it. But that is a very small percentage, is it not? I interrupted. All right, all right. You know, but now let us know, too. I perceive you are still sceptical. But first let me say this. To be sure means that when the right solution is reached, everything falls into place. You perceive that in no other way could things have happened. For the love of Mike, I said, get on with it. I, I grant you all the points you've made. Poirot arranged himself comfortably in his chair and motioned to the inspector to replenish his glass. One thing, mes amis, must be clearly understood. To solve any problem, one must have the facts. For that, one needs the dog, the dog who is a retriever, 
who brings the pieces one by one and lays them at the feet of the master, I said, admit it. One cannot from one seat in a chair solve a case solely from reading about it in a newspaper. For one's facts must be accurate, and newspapers are seldom, if ever, accurate. They report something happened at four o'clock when it was a quarter past four. They say a man had a sister called Elizabeth when actually he had a sister-in-law called Alexandra, and so on. But in Colin here, I have a dog of remarkable ability. An ability, I may say, which has taken him far in his own career. He has always had a remarkable memory. He can repeat to you, even several days later, conversations that have taken place. He can repeat them accurately, that is, not transposing them as nearly all of us do, to what the impression made on him was. To explain roughly, he would not say, and at twenty past eleven the post came, instead of describing what actually happened, namely a knock on the front door and someone coming into the room with letters in their hand. All this is very important. It means that he heard what I would have heard if I had been there and seen what I would have seen. Only the poor dog hasn't made the necessary deductions. So, as far as can be, I have the facts. I am in the picture. It is your wartime term, is it not, to put one in the picture? <clears throat> the thing that struck me first of all when Colin recounted the story to me was its highly fantastic character. Four clocks, each roughly an hour ahead of the right time, and all introduced into the house without the knowledge of the owner, or so she said. For we must never, must we, believe what we are told until such statements have been carefully checked. Your mind works the way that mine does, said Hardcastle approvingly. On the floor lies a dead man, a respectable-looking elderly man. Nobody knows who he is, or again, so they say. In his pocket is a card bearing the name of Mr. R. H. Curry, 7 Denver Street, Metropolis Insurance Company. But there is no Metropolis Insurance Company. There is no Denver Street, and there seems to be no such person as Mr. Curry. That is negative evidence, but it is evidence. We now proceed further. Apparently, at about ten minutes to two, a secretarial agency is rung up, and Miss Millicent Pebmarsh asks for a stenographer to be sent to 19 Wilbraham Crescent at three o'clock. It is particularly asked that a Miss Sheila Webb should be sent. Miss Webb is sent. She arrives there at a few minutes before three, goes, according to instructions, into the sitting room, finds a dead man on the floor, and rushes out of the house, screaming. She rushes into the arms of a young man. Poirot paused and looked at me, and I bowed. Enter our young hero, I said. You see, Poirot pointed out, even you cannot resist a farcical, melodramatic tone when you speak of it. The whole thing is melodramatic, fantastic, and completely unreal. It is the kind of thing that could occur in the writings of such people as Gary Gregson, for instance. I may mention that when my young friend arrived with this tale, I was embarking on a course of thriller writers who had plied their craft over the last sixty years. Most interesting. One comes almost to regard actual crimes in the light of fiction. That is to say that if I observe that a dog has not barked when he should bark, I say to myself, Ah, a Sherlock Holmes crime. Similarly, if the corpse is found in a sealed room, naturally, I say, Ha, ah, a Dixon Carr case. Then there is my friend Mrs. Oliver. If I were to find... But I will say no more. You catch my meaning. So here is the setting of a crime in such wildly improbable circumstances that one feels at once this book is not true to life. All this is quite unreal. But alas, that will not do here, for this is real. It happened. That gives one to think furiously, does it not? Hardcastle wouldn't have put it like that, but he fully agreed with the sentiment and nodded vigorously. Poirot went on. It is, as it were, the opposite of Chesterton's Where would you hide a leaf in a forest? Where would you hide a pebble on a beach? Here there is excess fantasy, melodrama. When I say to myself in imitation of Chesterton, Where does a middle-aged woman hide her fading beauty? I do not reply, 
amongst other faded middle-aged faces, not at all. She hides it under makeup, under rouge and mascara, with handsome furs wrapped around her and with jewels around her neck and hanging in her ears. Hmm? You follow me? Well, said the inspector, disguising the fact that he didn't, because then, you see, people will look at the furs and the jewels and the coiffure and the haute couture, and they will not observe what the woman herself is like at all. So I say to myself, and I say to my friend Colin, since this murder has so many fantastic trappings to distract one, it must really be very simple. Did I not? You did, I said. But I still don't see how you can possibly be right. For that, <laughs> you must wait. So then, we discard the trappings of the crime, and we go to the essentials. A man has been killed. Why has he been killed? And who is he? The answer to the first question will obviously depend on the answer to the second. And until you get the right answer to these two questions, you cannot possibly proceed. He could be a blackmailer or a confidence trickster or somebody's husband whose existence was obnoxious or dangerous to his wife. He could be one of a dozen things. The more I heard, the more everybody seems to agree that he looked a perfectly ordinary, well-to-do, reputable elderly man. And suddenly I think to myself, you say this should be a simple crime? Very well, make it so. Let this man be exactly what he seems, a well-to-do, respectable, elderly man. He looked at the inspector. You see? Well, said the inspector again, and paused politely. So, here is someone, an ordinary, pleasant, elderly man, whose removal is necessary to someone. To whom? And here at last we can narrow the field a little. There is local knowledge of Miss Pebmarsh and her habits, of the Cavendish Secretarial Bureau, of a girl working there called Sheila Webb. And so I say to my friend Colin, the neighbors, converse with them, find out about them, their backgrounds, but above all, engage in conversation. Because in conversation you do not get merely the answers to questions. In ordinary conversational prattle, things slip out. People are on their guard when the subject may be dangerous to them, but the moment ordinary talk ensues, they relax, they succumb to the relief of speaking the truth, which is always very much easier than lying. And so they let slip one little fact which, unbeknown to them, makes all the difference. An admirable exposition, I said. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it didn't happen in this case. But, mon cher, it did. One little sentence of inestimable importance. What? I demanded. Who said it? When? In due course, mon cher. You were saying, Monsieur Poirot, the inspector politely drew Poirot back to the subject. If you draw a circle round number 19, anybody within it might have killed Mr. Curry. Mrs. Hemming, the Blands, the McNaughtons, Miss Waterhouse. But more important still, there are those already positioned on the spot. Miss Pebmarsh, who could have killed him before she went out at 1.35 or thereabouts, and Miss Webb, who could have arranged to meet him there and killed him before rushing from the house and giving the alarm. Ah, said the inspector, you're coming down to brass tacks now. And of course, said Poirot, wheeling round, you, my dear Colin, you were also on the spot, looking for a high number where the low numbers were. Well, really, I said indignantly, what will you say next? Me! Ah! <laughs> I say anything, declared Poirot grandly, and yet I am the person who comes and dumps the whole thing in your lap. Murderers are often conceited, Poirot pointed out, and there too it might have amused you to have a joke like that at my expense. If you go on, you'll convince me, I said. I was beginning to feel uncomfortable. Poirot turned back to Inspector Hardcastle. Here, I say to myself, must be essentially a simple crime. The presence of irrelevant clocks, the advancing of time by an hour, the arrangements made so deliberately for the discovery of the body, all these must be set aside for the moment. They are, as is said in your immortal Alice, like shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. The vital point is that an ordinary elderly man is dead and that somebody wanted him dead. If we knew who the dead man was, it would give us a pointer to his killer. 
If he was a well-known blackmailer, then we must look for a man who could be blackmailed. If he was a detective, then we look for a man who has a criminal secret. If he's a man of wealth, then we look among his heirs. If we do not know who the man is, then we have the more difficult task of hunting amongst those in the surrounding circle for a man who has a reason to kill. Setting aside Miss Pebmarsh and Sheila Webb, who is there who might not be what they seem to be? The answer was disappointing, with the exception of Mr. Ramsay, who I understood was not what he seemed to be. Hmm? Here Poirot looked inquiringly at me, and I nodded. Everybody's bona fides were genuine. Bland was a well-known local builder. McNaughton had had a chair at Cambridge. Mrs. Hemming was the widow of a local auctioneer. The Waterhouses were respectable residents of long standing. So we come back to Mr. Curry. Where did he come from? What brought him to 19 Wilbraham Crescent? And here... One very valuable remark was spoken by one of the neighbours, Mrs. Hemming. When told that the dead man did not live at number 19, she said, Oh, I see. He just came there to be killed. How odd. She had the gift often possessed by those who are too occupied with their own thoughts to pay attention to what others are saying, to come to the heart of the problem. She summed up the whole crime. Mr. Curry came to 19 Wilbraham Crescent to be killed. It was as simple as that. That remark of hers struck me at the time, I said. Poirot took no notice of me. Dilly, 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 come and be killed. Mr. Curry came, and he was killed. But that was not all. It was important that he should not be identified. He had no wallet, no papers, the tailor's marks were removed from his clothes, but that would not be enough. The printed card of Curry, insurance agent, was only a temporary measure. If the man's identity was to be concealed permanently, he must be given a false identity. Sooner or later, I was sure, somebody would turn up, recognize him positively, and that would be that. A brother, a sister, a wife. It was a wife. Mrs. Rifle and the name alone might have aroused suspicion. There is a village in Somerset, I've stayed near there with friends, the village of Curry Rival. Subconsciously, without knowing why those two names suggested themselves, they were chosen. Mr. Curry, Mrs. Rival. So far, the plan is obvious, but what puzzled me was why our murderer took for granted that there would be no real identification. If the man had no family, there are at least landladies, servants, business associates. That led me to the next assumption. This man was not known to be missing. A further assumption was that he was not English and was only visiting this country. That would tie in with the fact that the dental work done on his teeth did not correspond with any dental records here. I began to have a shadowy picture both of the victim and of the murderer. No, more than that. The crime was well planned and intelligently carried out, but now there came that one piece of sheer bad luck that no murderer can foresee. And what was that? asked Hardcastle. Unexpectedly, Poirot threw his head back and recited dramatically, For want of a nail, the shoe was lost. For want of a shoe, the horse was lost. For want of a horse, the battle was lost. For want of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And all for the want of a horseshoe nail. He leaned forward. A good many people could have killed Mr. Curry, but only one person could have killed or could have had reason to kill the girl Edna. We both stared at him. Let us consider... The Cavendish Secretarial Bureau. Eight girls work there. On the 9th of September, four of those girls were out on assignment some little distance away. That is, they were provided with lunch by the clients to whom they had gone. They were the four who normally took the first lunch period from 12.30 to 1.30. The remaining four, Sheila Webb, Edna Brent, and two girls, Janet and Maureen, took the second period, 1.30 to 2.30. 
But on that day, Edna Brent had an accident quite soon after leaving the office. She tore the heel of her shoe in the grating. She could not walk like that. She bought some buns and came back to the office. Poirot shook an emphatic finger at us. We have been told that Edna Brent was worried about something. She tried to see Sheila Webb out of the office, but failed. It has been assumed that that something was connected with Sheila Webb, but there is no evidence of that. She might only have wanted to consult Sheila Webb about something that had puzzled her, but if so, one thing was clear. She wanted to talk to Sheila Webb, away from the Bureau. Her words to the constable at the inquest are the only clue we have as to what was worrying her. She said something like, I don't see how what she said can have been true. Three women had given evidence that morning. Edna could have been referring to Miss Pebmarsh, or, as it has been generally assumed, she could have been referring to Sheila Webb. But there is a third possibility. She could have been referring to Miss Martindale. Miss Martindale. But her evidence only lasted a few minutes. Exactly. It consisted only of the telephone call she had received purporting to be from Miss Pedmarsh. Do you mean that Edna knew that it wasn't from Miss Pedmarsh? I think it was simpler than that. I am suggesting that there was no telephone call at all. He went on. The heel of Edna's shoe came off. The grating was quite close to the office. She came back to the bureau. But Miss Martindale in her private office did not know that Edna had come back. As far as she knew, there was nobody but herself in the bureau. All she need do was to say a telephone call had come through at 1.49. Edna does not see the significance of what she knows at first. Sheila is called in to Miss Martindale and told to go out on an appointment. How and when that appointment was made is not mentioned to Edna. News of the murder comes through, and little by little the story gets more definite. Miss Pebmarsh rang up and asked for Sheila Webb to be sent, but Miss Pebmarsh says it was not she who rang up. The call is said to have come through at ten minutes to two. But Edna knows that could not be true. No telephone call came through then. Miss Martindale must have made a mistake, but... Miss Martindale definitely doesn't make mistakes. The more Edna thinks about it, the more puzzling it is. She must ask Sheila about it. Sheila will know. And then comes the inquest, and the girls all go to it. Miss Martindale repeats her story of the telephone call, and Edna knows definitely now that the evidence Miss Martindale gives so clearly, with such precision as to the exact time, is untrue. It was then that she asked the constable if she could speak to the inspector. I think probably that Miss Martindale, leaving the corn market in a crowd of people, overheard her asking that. Perhaps by then she had heard the girls chaffing Edna about her shoe accident without realizing what it involved. Anyway, she followed the girl to Wilbraham Crescent. Why did Edna go there, I wonder? Just to stare at the place where it happened, I expect, said Hardcastle with a sigh. People do. Yes, that is true enough. Perhaps Miss Martindale speaks to her there, walks with her down the road, and Edna plumps out her question. Miss Martindale acts quickly. They are just by the telephone box. She says, This is very important. You must ring up the police at once. The number of the police station is so-and-so. Ring up and tell them we are both coming there now. It is second nature for Edna to do what she is told. She goes in, picks up the receiver, and Miss Martindale comes in behind her, pulls the scarf round her neck, and strangles her. And nobody saw this? Poirot shrugged his shoulders. They might have done, but they didn't. It was just on one o'clock, lunch time, and what people there were in the Crescent were busy staring at nineteen. It was a chance boldly taken by a bold and unscrupulous woman. Hardcastle was shaking his head doubtfully. Miss Martindale, I, I don't see how she can possibly come into it. No, one does not see at first. But since Miss Martindale undoubtedly killed Edna, oh, yes, only she could have killed Edna, then she must come into it. 
and I begin to suspect that in Miss Martindale we have the Lady Macbeth of this crime, a woman who is ruthless and unimaginative. Unimaginative? queried Hardcastle. Oh, yes, quite unimaginative, but very efficient, a good planner. But why? Where's the motive? Hercule Poirot looked at me, and he wagged a finger. So the neighbor's conversation was no use to you, eh? I found one most illuminating sentence. Do you remember that after talking of living abroad, Mrs. Bland remarked that she liked living in Crowdean because she had a sister here? But Mrs. Bland was not supposed to have a sister. She had inherited a large fortune a year ago from a Canadian great-uncle because she was the only surviving member of his family. Hardcastle sat up alertly. So you think... Poirot leaned back in his chair and put his fingertips together. He half-closed his eyes and spoke dreamily. Say you are a man, a very ordinary and not too scrupulous man, in bad financial difficulties. A letter comes one day from a firm of lawyers to say that your wife has inherited a big fortune from a great uncle in Canada. The letter is addressed to Mrs. Bland, and the only difficulty is that the Mrs. Bland who received it is the wrong, Mrs. Bland. She is the second wife, not the first one. Imagine the chagrin, the fury. And then an idea comes. Who is to know that it is the wrong, Mrs. Bland? Nobody in Crody knows that Bland was married before. His first marriage years ago took place during the war when he was overseas. Presumably his first wife died soon afterwards, and he almost immediately remarried. He has the original marriage certificate, various family papers, photographs of Canadian relations, now dead. It will be all plain sailing. Anyway, it's worth risking. They risk it, and it comes off. The legal formalities go through, and there the Blands are rich and prosperous, all their financial troubles over. And then, a year later, something happens. What happens? I suggest that someone was coming over from Canada to this country, and that this someone had known the first Mrs. Bland well enough not to be deceived by an impersonation. He may have been an elderly member of the family attorneys, or a close friend of the family, but whoever he was, he will know. Perhaps they thought of ways of avoiding a meeting. Mrs. Bland could feign illness, she could go abroad, but anything of that kind would only arouse suspicion. The visitor would insist on seeing the woman he had come over to see. And so, to murder? Yes, and here I fancy Mrs. Bland's sister may have been the ruling spirit. She thought up and planned the whole thing. You're taking it that Miss Martindale and Mrs. Bland are sisters? It is the only way things make sense. Mrs. Bland did remind me of someone when I saw her, said Hardcastle. They're very different in manner, but it's true. Yes, there is a likeness. But how could they hope to get away with it? The man would be missed. Inquiries would be made. If this man were travelling abroad, perhaps for pleasure and not for business, his schedule would be vague. A letter from one place, a postcard from another, it would be a little time before people wondered why they had not heard from him. By that time, who would connect a man identified and buried as Harry Castleton with a rich Canadian visitor to the country who has not even been seen in this part of the world? If I had been the murderer, I would have slipped over on a day trip to France or Belgium and discarded the dead man's passport in a train or a tram so that the inquiry would take place from another country. I moved involuntarily, and Poirot's eyes came round to me. Yes, he said. Bland mentioned to me that he'd recently taken a day trip to Boulogne, with a blonde, I understand, which would make it quite a natural thing to do. Doubtless it is a habit of his. This is still conjecture, Hardcastle objected. But inquiries can be made, said Poirot. He took a sheet of hotel notepaper from the rack in front of him and handed it to Hardcastle. If you will write to Mr. Enderby at 10 Ennismore Gardens, SW7... He has promised to make certain inquiries for me in Canada. He is a well-known international lawyer. And what about the business of the clocks? Oh, the clocks, those famous clocks, Poirot smiled. 
I think you will find that Miss Martindale was responsible for them. Since the crime, as I said, was a simple crime, it was disguised by making it a fantastic one. That rosemary clock that Sheila Webb took to be repaired, did she lose it in the Bureau of Secretarial Studies? Did Miss Martindale take it as the foundation of her rigmarole, and was it partly because of that clock that she chose Sheila as the person to discover the body? Ardcastle burst out, and you say this woman is unimaginative when she concocted all this. But she did not concoct it. That is what is so interesting. It was all there waiting for her. From the very first I detected a pattern. A pattern I knew. A pattern familiar, because I had just been reading such patterns. I've been very fortunate. As Colin here will tell you, I attended this week a sale of author's manuscripts. Among them were some of Gary Gregson's. I hardly dared hope, but luck was with me. Here, like a conjurer, he whipped from a drawer in the desk two shabby exercise books. It is all here, among the many plots of books he planned to write. He did not live to write this one, but Miss Martindale, who was his secretary, knew all about it. She just lifted it bodily to suit her purpose. But the clocks must have meant something originally, in, in Gregson's plot, I mean. Oh, yes. His clocks were set at one minute past five, four minutes past five, and seven minutes past five. That was the combination number of a safe, five, one, five, four, five, seven. The safe was concealed behind the reproduction of the Mona Lisa. Inside the safe, continued Poirot with distaste, were the crown jewels of the Russian royal family. And Tadabatiz, the whole thing. And, of course, there was a story of kinds, a persecuted girl. Oh, yes, it came in very handy for La Martindale. She just chose her local characters and adapted the story to fit in. All these flamboyant clues would lead... Where? Exactly nowhere. Ah, <laughs> yes, an efficient woman. One wonders, he left her a legacy, did he not? How and of what did he die, I wonder? Hardcastle refused to be interested in past history. He gathered up the exercise books and took the sheet of hotel paper from my hand. For the last two minutes I'd been staring at it, fascinated. Hardcastle had scribbled down Enderby's address without troubling to turn the sheet the right way up. The hotel address was upside down in the left-hand bottom corner. Staring at the sheet of paper, I knew what a fool I'd been. Well, thank you, Monsieur Poirot, said Hardcastle. You've certainly given us something to think about. Whether anything will come of it, I am most delighted if I have been of any assistance. Poirot was playing it modestly. I'll have to check various things. Naturally, naturally. Goodbyes were said. Hardcastle took his departure. Poirot turned his attention to me. His eyebrows rose. Eh bien, and what, may I ask, is biting you? You look like a man who has seen an apparition. I've seen what a fool I've been. Ah, well, that happens to many of us, but presumably not to Hercule Poirot. I had to attack him. Just tell me one thing, Poirot. If, as you said, you could do all this sitting in your chair in London and it could have got me and Dick Hardcastle to come to you there, why why did you come down here at all? I told you, they make the reparation in my apartment. They would have lent you another apartment, or you could have gone to the Ritz. You'd have been more comfortable there than in the Curlew Hotel. Indubitably, said Hercule Poirot. The coffee here, mon Dieu, the coffee. Well, then why? Hercule Poirot flew into a rage. Eh bien, since you are too stupid to guess, I will tell you. I am human, am I not? I can be the machine if it is necessary. I can lie back and think. I can solve the problem so. But I am human, I tell you. And the problems concern human beings. And so, the explanation is as simple as the murder was simple. I came out of human curiosity said Hercule Poirot, with an attempt at dignity. Chapter 29 Colin Lamb's Narrative Once more I was in Wilbraham Crescent, proceeding in a westerly direction. I stopped before the gate of number 19. No one came screaming out of the house this time. It was neat and peaceful. I went up to the front door and rang the bell. Miss Millicent Pebmarsh opened it. 
This is Colin Lamb, I said. May I come in and speak to you? Certainly. She preceded me into the sitting room. You seem to spend a lot of time down here, Mr. Lamb. I understood that you were not connected with the local police. You understood rightly. I think, really, you've known exactly who I am from the first day you spoke to me. I'm not sure quite what you mean by that. I've been extremely stupid, Miss Pepmarsh. I came to this place to look for you. I found you the first day I was here, and I didn't know I'd found you. Possibly murder distracted you. As you say, I was also stupid enough to look at a piece of paper the wrong way up. And what is the point of all this? Just that the game is up, Miss Pebmarsh. I found the headquarters where all the planning is done. Such records and memoranda as are necessary are kept by you on the micro-dot system in Braille. The information Larkin got at Portlebury was passed to you. From here it went to its destination by means of Ramsey. He came across when necessary from his house to yours at night by way of the garden. He dropped a check coin in your garden one day. That was careless of him. We're all careless at some time or another. Your cover's very good. You're blind, you work at an institute for disabled children, you keep children's books in Braille in your house, as is only natural. You're a woman of unusual intelligence and personality. I don't know what's the driving power that animates you. Say, if you like, that I'm dedicated. Yes, I thought it might be like that. And why are you telling me all this? It seems unusual. I looked at my watch. You have two hours, Miss Pebmarsh. In two hours' time, members of the special branch will come here and take charge. I don't understand you. Why do you come here ahead of your people to give me what seems to be a warning? It is a warning. I've come here myself, and shall remain here until my people arrive to see that nothing leaves this house, with one exception. That exception is you yourself. You have two hours' start if you choose to go. But why? Why? I said slowly, because I think there's an off chance that you might shortly become my mother-in-law. I may be quite wrong. There was a silence. Millicent Pebmarsh got up and went to the window. I didn't take my eyes off her. I had no illusions about Millicent Pebmarsh. I didn't trust her an inch. She was blind, but even a blind woman can catch you if you're off guard. Her blindness wouldn't handicap her if she once got her chance to jam an automatic against my spine. She said quietly, I shall not tell you if you're right or wrong. What makes you think that, that it might be so? Eyes. But we're not alike in character, no. She spoke almost defiantly. I did the best I could for her. Well, that's a matter of opinion. With you, a cause came first. As it should do, I don't agree. There was silence again. Then I asked, Did you know who she was that day? Not until I heard the name. I'd kept myself informed about her, always. You were never as inhuman as you would have liked to be. Don't talk nonsense. I looked at my watch again. Time's going on, I said. She came back from the window and across to the desk. I have a photograph of her here, as a child. I was behind her as she pulled the drawer open. It wasn't an automatic. It was a small, very deadly knife. My hand closed over hers and took it away. I may be soft, but I'm not a fool, I said. She felt for a chair and sat down. She displayed no emotion, whatever. I'm not taking advantage of your offer. What would be the use? I shall stay here until... until they come. There are always opportunities, even in prison. Of indoctrination, you mean, if you like to put it that way? We sat there, hostile to each other, but with understanding. I've resigned from the service, I told her. I'm going back to my old job, marine biology. There's a post going at a university in Australia. I think you're wise. You haven't got what it takes for this job. You're like Rosemary's father. He couldn't understand Lenin's dictum, away with softness. I thought of Hercule Poirot's words. I'm content, I said, to be human. We sat there in silence, each of us convinced that the other's point of view was wrong. 
Letter from Detective Inspector Hardcastle to Monsieur Hercule Poirot. Dear Monsieur Poirot, we are now in possession of certain facts, and I feel you may be interested to hear about them. A Mr. Quentin Dugesclin of Quebec left Canada for Europe approximately four weeks ago. He has no near relatives, and his plans for return were indefinite. His passport was found by the proprietor of a small restaurant in Boulogne, who handed it in to the police. It has not so far been claimed. Mr. Duquesclin was a lifelong friend of the Montresor family of Quebec. The head of that family, Mr. Henry Montresor, died 18 months ago, leaving his very considerable fortune to his only surviving relative, his great-niece Valerie, described as the wife of Josiah Bland of Portlebury, England. A very reputable firm of London solicitors acted for the Canadian executors. All communications between Mrs. Bland and her family in Canada ceased from the time of her marriage, of which her family did not approve. Mr. Dugesclin mentioned to one of his friends that he intended to look up the Blands while he was in England, since he had always been very fond of Valerie. The body hitherto identified as that of Henry Castleton has been positively identified as Quentin Dugesclin. Certain boards have been found stowed away in a corner of Bland's building yard. Though hastily painted out, the words Snowflake Laundry are plainly perceptible after treatment by experts. I will not trouble you with lesser details, but the public prosecutor considers that a warrant can be granted for the arrest of Josiah Bland. Miss Martindale and Mrs. Bland are, as you conjectured, sisters, but though I agree with your views on her participation in these crimes, satisfactory evidence will be hard to obtain. She is undoubtedly a very clever woman. I have hopes, though, of Mrs. Bland. She is the type of woman who rats. The death of the first Mrs. Bland through enemy action in France and his second marriage to Hilda Martindale, who was in the Naffy, also in France, can be, I think, clearly established, though many records were, of course, destroyed at that time. It was a great pleasure meeting you that day, and I must thank you for the very useful suggestions you made on that occasion. I hope the alterations and redecorations of your London flat have been satisfactory. Your sincerely... Richard Hardcastle. Further communication from R.H. to H.P. Good news. The bland woman cracked, admitted the whole thing. Puts the blame entirely on her sister and her husband. She never understood until too late what they meant to do. Thought they were only going to dope him so that he wouldn't recognize she was the wrong woman. A likely story. But I'd say it's true enough that she wasn't the prime mover. The Portobello Market people have identified Miss Martindale as the American lady who bought two of the clocks. Mrs. McNaughton now says she saw Du Gesclin in Bland's van being driven into Bland's garage. Did she really? Our friend Colin has married that girl. If you ask me, he's mad. All the best. Yours, Richard Hardcastle. Production copyright 2004. All rights reserved. As part of our Mystery Masters imprint, the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of many other Hercule Poirot mysteries, including Murder on the Orient Express, Evil Under the Sun, The ABC Murders, The Mystery of the Blue Train, and One, Two, Buckle My Shoe. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.